that's going to get you going all summer. You're going to have that in your mind. Like it's going to be a party at church this summer. You're not going to want to miss it. Uh, any July anniversaries in the house? Anyone celebrating a summer anniversary? Congratulations. My wife and I are celebrating our anniversary. And two weeks from now, it's going to be our 19th anniversary. Wow. Now, we were just babies when we got married. You could tell. I'm barely over 19 now. How many of you learn a lot about someone when you live in the same house with them day after day, all day, in close proximity, right? You learn a lot, right? Well, most of it's endearing. <laughs> Any first year anniversary people? Where's all the first year anniversary people in the house? Any first year? Yeah, okay, a few of you. Yeah, you're on this journey. You learn to like each other's, you, you, you learn your likes and your dislikes, right? You learn your quirks and your idiosyncrasies. Uh, you even start to learn how each other thinks, right? How many know that there's some arguments and tense conversations that happen when one person in the relationship is thinking differently, right? Have you ever had that kind of, I was thinking differently about this issue that we're talking about, right? I, I think the sooner you figure out how the other person is thinking, the faster you can get on the same page and live in harmony. If you've been married a few years, let me hear you say amen. amen. <laughs> All right. Well, let me give you an example from my personal experience. Uh, anyone ever heard of the five love languages? The Five Love Languages, a book by Dr. Gary Chapman. And in it, he asserts that everyone expresses and receives love in one of five different ways. And the five ways that he talks about are quality time, words of affirmation, gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. Now, if you haven't heard of the Five Love Languages, you're welcome. This is going to set you up for success. Because when I got married, I didn't know about the Five Love Languages. And so one day, uh, I got a quick lesson uh, in my newlywed uh, marriage. So back when we got married, I was working full-time as a youth pastor in Elmira, Ontario, and Holly was still going to Bible college uh, full-time as well. She was working part-time at the mall and also volunteering at the church, and so she had a lot on her plate, and so she would work often at the mall on Saturday afternoons, and so uh, me being the husband that I am, I uh, just wanted to bless her. And so while she was working, I thought, you know what, I'll just, I'll clean the house while she's away. And so I got the vacuum and I had carpet, you know, the carpet, I, I got all the straight lines. Anyone, like, you're the straight lines on the carpet kind of person, right? I had the, the carpet all with the straight lines and I made the bed and I even folded that little extra blanket that goes at the foot of the bed. And I fluffed and I placed all 50 of the pillows that go on the bed. Yeah. I don't know what those are for, right? Because every night we get in bed, we just throw them on the floor. But then every morning, we put them back on the bed. And so I, I give them the karate chop, and I, like, place them all there. And the house was looking uh, spick and span. It was sparkling. And so she got home from work that day, and she came in the door, and I greeted her at the door. So. Yeah. And she goes, What? <laughs> Uh, you clean the house. You know, I was like, I did it for you. <laughs> How many know, as an acts of service person, like the whole time I'm vacuuming and chopping pillows and putting the blanket, I'm thinking, I'm doing this for her. I love her. I'm, going, I'm doing all of this as an act of love for her. You know what her response was to me? Yeah, you clean the house. You live here too. <laughs> That's where I learned about the five love languages. And that mine is acts of service. She'll tell you, if you ask her what hers is, she'll tell you that it's all of them. All of them. She loves all of them. Uh, you know, one thing I've noticed about Holly as we've been married all these years, and we started to have kids. And, and anyone remember when you were a kid and you would ask your parents for something you really wanted and they would like, really disappoint you? Do you remember your, your parents would really crush your dreams, right? Do you remember as a kid, like, you would ask to go with your friends and your parents would say, well, no, but you were out so late last night that I think you should have an early bedtime tonight. Do you remember that? Right? Remember you wanted to buy something and you only had a little bit of money, so you had to buy something that was fairly cheap and your parents would be like, no, we're not going to waste money on something that's just going to break, right? And you would be like so devastated and heartbroken. Or maybe you wanted to, to go to that big event. This is the thing that you have been waiting for. All your friends are going to this big event and your parents will always plan something on that weekend. I'm sorry, our family has other plans. You can't go. 
right? I, I wish this was met with understanding and acceptance, but how many know most of the time it's met with like a meltdown, it's, it's melt with like tears and yelling, something about like, like you don't want me to have any fun. Like, you just want to ruin my life, right? You ever had that experience as a kid? Right? As parents, we, we get to be the ones now who disappoint our kids. You know, it's awesome. Yeah. It's a privilege, I guess, you know. And, and so they have the meltdown, and we're ruining their lives and all of that kind of stuff. And one of the things I noticed about my wife is that every time that she disappoints the kids, uh, or me sometimes, uh, not that she ever disappoints me, but you know, <laughs> going to get in trouble here. But I always notice as the kids are walking down, you know, maybe away from her, she'll always say this. She'll go, I love you. Right? And she's not being sarcastic. She's actually being reassuring. And she really wants them to know that even though she's disappointed them, she loves them and wants the best for them. You know, I, I typed uh, love is into Google search this week just to see what the analytic predictive uh, text would pull up. And I put love is, but I didn't leave the space. So Love Island, I don't know what that is, a TV show. Season 8, Love Island UK, Love Island 2022, uh, it all came up. So then I had to put a little space, like love is. And then this is what came up. Love is blind. Well, maybe you turn to the person beside you and say, oh, yeah, apparently it is. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Sorry, it's a long week. I'm, I'm feeling loose today. It's a long weekend, I guess. I don't know. Holy Spirit, speak through me. Don't <laughs> hide my words. Okay. Love is blind. Love is a war. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where are we going with this? I don't know. Love is patient. Love is kind. And love is the answer. Everyone say love is the answer. How many know that we tend to make things so complicated sometimes, don't we? Like especially in church world, as we, we complicate things with our theology and our doctrine. We complicate them with our systems and our rituals. And, and how many know that Jesus and the Bible try to make things simple for us? Love is the answer. 1 John chapter 3 says this, This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. That's it. That's the whole Bible summarized. Have a great weekend. All right, you guys are out. Oh, okay. In one verse, God says all you need is love, and love is all you need. Notice that it doesn't say that this is a message, or it's not one of the messages, but it is the message. From the very beginning, the message of God has been love one another. You want to see how much we complicate things? Let me ask you this question right now. What is the meaning of life? What is life's purpose? You know, for many of us, the meaning of life, it seems so grand, so elusive. You know, how can we even understand it? How can we even put it into words? You ever found that sometimes when the answer seems too simple, that we go looking for a more complicated, more complex answer? You know, like, this must be too simple. It's too easy, too basic. I, I got to find something more difficult. There must be a different answer. God says the meaning and the message of life is love. One day, a number of religious leaders were philosophizing about uh, this age-old but important question, and, and they were talking about the meaning of life, and they were talking about eternal life and the resurrection, and, and one of them comes to Jesus and asks him, teacher, what's the most important command in the law of Moses? And notice that Jesus, he doesn't even flinch. He's not like, oh, give me a moment to think about that. He doesn't say, let me go home and analyze all 613 of the Old Testament commands and I'll come back to you with an answer. It's like, you know, like the family feud. He's, he's like, he buzzes in right away. Right? I got the answer to this. Buzzes in. He says, Jesus replies in Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37. He buzzes in. He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Everything, Jesus says, that you've heard from the, from the beginning, every verse of the Old Testament, every verse of prophecy, every commandment, find their roots in these two commandments. Love God and love people. Love is the answer. 
You know, what's crazy to me as I read this, that Jesus, he, he puts these two commandments together. He says that they're equally important, that they're inex, uh, inextricably linked. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking in our made new series about how the fact that we can't separate how we love God from how we love people. And I know it's hard because sometimes people fail us, but God is always faithful. As we saw in our last series a couple weeks ago, that that's the reference point for our new life as believers, not what other people have done to us, but our reference point is how faithful God has been to us. We treat others not based on how they treat us, but we treat others based on how God has treated us, and that's with love. See, love is a starting point for all of our Christian value. Love is a starting point for every biblical teaching. It's the purpose of God's creation. Love is the basis of every blessing, of every calling, and every benefit that God bestows on us. Love is the answer. And so we're kicking off this new summer uh, sermon series, and uh, we called it Juicy Fruit. And, and over the summer, we're going to be looking at nine characteristics uh, uh, that Scripture describes as the evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And so I wanted to get you uh, into the Spirit. I wanted to get you, uh, you know, the, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I wanted to get you salivating about what God wants to do in your life this year, uh, this summer. And, and I thought it would be fun uh, to, to get you some juicy fruit. So how many grabbed the juicy fruit on your way in? If you got it, uh, you know, uh, maybe you grew up in church and the, your mom was saying that you're not, you can't chew gum in church. Well, for one day only, at least this day, the pastor's telling you you can have gum in church. Just make sure you're not blowing bubbles or sticking it under the, you know, the chair when you're done. If you didn't get one, you can get it on your way out today. But why don't you grab a piece of gum and turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. When you're there, say, love is the answer. Galatians 5. So we just finished a series through Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and we saw that that letter was unique because it wasn't directed to a specific church per se, but it was kind of like a collection, a master class of Paul's uh, understanding of salvation and theology. Uh, but this letter, this letter is to the church in Galatia, and this is a letter addressing some specific issues within the church. And so in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, we see a theme that's similar to what we read in Ephesians, but Paul's going to expand a bit, a bit on it here. Galatians 5 verse 16 says, so I say that the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. How many have experienced this? Verse 22 but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. How many love an all-you-can-eat buffet? Anybody? Woo! Yeah. Some of you are a bit more disciplined. You're on a strict diet or a strict, you know, uh, you know, consistent meal plan. But you have to have cheat day, right? So how many like cheat day on your meal plan, right? That's when all the restrictions are listed. There's no limits. You can have as much of the deliciousness as you want. The Bible says that there's no limit to how much of this fruit you can have in your life. There's no law against these things. But what we really notice, though, is that this isn't about fruit consumption, but it's about fruit production, this isn't about what God wants to do for us as much as it is what God wants to do in us. One author described the fruit of the Spirit this way. The fruit of the Spirit is the character of Christ produced by the Spirit of Christ and the followers of Christ. Fruit speaks to character. A, per, a person producing the fruit of the Spirit is someone who's growing in righteousness and godliness. You know, when it comes to the fruit of love, as we're talking about today, what does that look like in our life? What, what is love? What is love? Just got to get that in, in your mind. There you go. Love is more than doing things for people. It's more than vacuuming and karate chopping the pillows. It's, it's more than that. Uh, love is more than supporting people through difficult times. 
Love is more than being a listening ear for when people are going through difficulty. All of those things are part of it, but it's so much more than that. I want to put out this premise today. Loving someone is seeing their value and helping them see it too. I think that's what God does for us. See, everything God is and everything God has done and everything God will do originates in his love. You've, you've heard this expression, God is love. That comes from 1 John 4. It says, dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. See, love isn't just something that God does. It's not an action or an emotion or a decision that God makes. It's so much more. See, love is the central attribute. It's the core aspect. It's the essence of God's character. Love is the lens through which God sees his creation. Love is the motivation for all that God says and does. Love is the Lord's disposition. God cannot act in any other way way because God is love. Loving someone is seeing their value and helping them see it too. You know, when it comes to our lives, scripture encourages us to let love be our highest goal. Right, we're talking about the meaning of life. What is the goal of life? It's the let love be our highest goal. First John 4 goes on to explain that the reason that we have capacity to love at all is that because we love each other, because God first loved us. We love in the way in which we have received love from God. we got to see God's love for us before we can truly see God's love through us. Well, does someone who doesn't know God, can, can they love? Well, sort of. Sort of, yeah. It, it looks very different. You know, love, according to those who don't know God, is often described as acceptance. Do I accept you? And what that really means, even as we see this tension in our world today, is that acceptance is equated to agreeance. I agree with you. I love you by agreeing with you. Or I love you uh, by affirming you in all your decisions that you make. And if you don't agree or you don't affirm, then you're not loving me and you're not accepting me. How many know that's how our culture equates love? That's not how scripture, that's not how God loves. God values and holds each person, regardless of their beliefs, regardless of acceptance. Love is uh, is seeing someone's value and helping them see it too, regardless of the agreements that we have with them. That's the kind of love that God has for us. See, as much as we have one message is to love one another, our world really has one problem, and it's a love problem. What's wrong with the world today is that people don't understand God's love for them. Every problem in this world is a love problem. Think about it. Think about every justice problem, every racial problem, every violence problem, every political problem, every economic disparity comes down really to being a love problem. Every problem in our world originates in not seeing the value that God places on others and helping them to see it Two, I mean, there's a difference between knowing about God's love and experiencing God's love personally. See, sin at its core is a fundamental, it's a fundamental lack of understanding about God's love. See, when Adam and Eve were in the garden and they sinned, it's because they knew about God's love for them, but they didn't understand God's love for them. So even though they'd experienced God's blessing and they experienced God's uh, uh, presence and relationship, they still doubted God's love. The enemy came and tried to plant these seeds that God was holding back, that was holding them back, right? He was trying to plant the seed that God was withholding from them their freedom or their autonomy or goodness. And so they began to doubt God's love for them, which caused them to distance themselves from the love of God. Every problem in this world originates in a love problem. It's a failure to understand love between God and people and between people and people. 
Scripture tells us that we know the fruit of the Spirit is growing in our lives when our automatic responses start looking more like Jesus. You know, when our automatic response is joy and peace and patience, it's really rooted in God's love for us and our love for people. I'm glad that we're like waiting a few weeks for patience. You know, the kids just got off school. You know, they're going to be home all day, every day. And, and so in a few weeks, we'll get to patience and we'll all just really encourage each other on that one, I'm sure. <laughs> Speaking of God's perfect love, it reminds me of the man who is always determined to see the bright side of everything and to always speak words of encouragement wherever he went. Well, one day, uh, he was at church, and after a very long and boring sermon, uh, as the congregation filed out the church, the man came to the pastor who was shaking hands at the door, and uh, he was struggling to find something positive and encouraging to say, and uh, so the, he just blurted out the first thing he could think of, uh, Pastor, your sermon today reminded me about the peace and the love of God. Well, the pastor, he was tickled. He said, well, no one's ever said that about my preaching before. He's kind of thrilled. He said, well, tell me, how did my preaching remind you of the peace and the love of God? Well, the man replied, it reminded me of the peace of God because it passed all understanding. And it reminded me of the love of God because it endured forever. <laughs> God is perfect. And his love is perfect. And so how are we supposed to love like God when we're not perfect? You know, there's something incredibly important that we need to understand here. Like, sometimes I have a hard time being kind before I've even had my first cup of coffee, you know? And yet we're supposed to love like God loves. Here's something we need to understand, that producing the fruit of the Spirit doesn't come from trying harder. The message of this sermon isn't let's go and try harder to produce the fruit that God wants in us. It actually comes from surrendering more. Let me say it again. It doesn't come from trying harder, but it comes from surrendering more. Notice what Galatians verse 16 said. It says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Let the Spirit guide your lives. This means that the Spirit takes the lead and we get into partnership we get into unity, we follow the Spirit's promptings, we follow the Spirit's conviction. You see here, the Apostle Paul, he's not giving us a list of godly characteristics to compare ourselves against. This isn't like a list where we go and we check off all the ones that we're crushing. Like, yeah, I'm really nailing those ones. Like, those are awesome fruits in my life, right? And then we kind of circle the ones that need improvement, you know? That's not what this is about. It's actually the opposite. Paul's saying, if you try to love like God, you'll fail. If you try to do it, you'll fail. But if you let God's love grow in you, you'll flourish in these things. These are responses that come out of us because we've been so steeped in the presence and the practices of God that it becomes our automatic response, not something we try to work up and, and try to do as a checklist. Paul is saying here that, that let God's love grow in you. And so this summer series, it's not about making you feel guilty. It's not about all the ways that we don't measure up or, uh, you know, that would be the opposite of what Paul is trying to do here in this letter. See, what Paul is trying to do in his letter is to help them see that many of them have fallen into a destructive trap. That's what Galatians is about. Many of them have fallen into this false gospel, into a false teaching, they were saying that they were saved by God's grace, but really they had been using the law or like a checklist as a barometer for their Christian walk. They were saying that it was God's grace that had saved them, but they were living as though their ability to keep the strict rules, uh, their ability to exhibit the, the godliest of behaviors was the key to their salvation. And really they were becoming really legalistic. That's what legalism is. Legalism says God will love us if we change. That's what legalism is. God will love us if I am worthy of his love. Paul's saying that's a trap. That doesn't work. No one needs to carry the burden of trying to live up to the law in order to be saved and to live for Jesus. So what he's saying to the Galatians is that from the beginning, their very understanding of God's love and their grace had transformed them and they were exploding with love and grace towards other people. But along the way, uh, they, they began to uh, see this changing in their life. The, instead of having the byproduct of the fruit of the Spirit, they had become legalistic in keeping the rules. 
They stopped pursuing this deeper and fuller understanding of God's love and had just created a checklist of whether or not my behavior was good today. And Paul's saying to them, salvation isn't earned. Salvation's not merited. It's not about being good enough. See, legalism says God will love us if we change, but the gospel says that God will change us because he loves us. And that's a stark difference. See, living by the law, as they knew from the Old Testament, demanded perfection. If you messed up and broke the law in any way, you were a lawbreaker. It was pass or fail. There was no grading on the curve. You know, there was none of that. It was pass or fail. But the true grace of the gospel is so freeing. And that's Paul, what Paul wants them to see here. He, he wants them to see that grace is freeing because grace assumes your imperfection. God's grace assumes your imperfection. God knows who you are. You were imperfect before he chose you. And yet he chose you anyway. Grace assumes our imperfection and it leads us in this progression towards righteousness more and more each day. See, justification is the declaration. That's the theological word that we use. that says God declares us just and right and perfect in his sight. That's how God sees us positionally. You know, it's kind of like a legal term. In legal terms, you are in good standing with God, but God and us both know that we're not perfect. And so sanctification is the process the Spirit brings us on, making us more and more into what God sees us to be. And the way we do that isn't by trying harder. You'll never hear me say, you need to go and try harder. Pray more and try harder. That's not the answer to anything, I don't think. Pray and try, that, that's part of partnership. That goes along with surrender. Surrender more to the Holy Spirit's leading in your life. Submit to the Holy Spirit's promptings. And the more you do, the more you'll resemble Jesus, that's the fruit the Spirit produces in our lives. So this summer series, it's not about how we don't measure up. It's not about how we need to try harder. It's not about how we aren't as good as we should be. This series is all about how can we be in the process of partnering with the Spirit for God to produce his fruit in us. Juicy Fruit is all about rediscovering the love of God and the value God places on us so that we can also love others and help them see the value God places on them too because loving someone is seeing their value and helping them see it too. I'm gonna invite you to stand this morning as we conclude in just a moment. See, as we look at these fruits, it's really about seeing that the love of God prompts us to love others and that we have joy in our lives because of the joy that God brings us. We live at peace with others because God gives us peace. We're patient with others because God's patient with us. We're kind and good and faithful and gentle and in self-control because of what God has done for us. But as we look at the start of this list, Paul starts this list with love. Because love is the answer. God is love. And God is the answer. Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you for my friends today. All across this room, Lord, on this long weekend. God, we've had some fun in church. God, we really just need your presence. We need your peace. We need your joy. We need your kindness. We need your gentleness. We need your self-control. All of that originates and starts with your love. And so I pray this morning for everyone in this place that your spirit would right in this moment be reminding them of your love for them. God, some of us here don't feel worthy of your love. But we know that there's things in our lives we've messed up, we've kind of run things our own way, Lord. We've hurt others and we've hurt ourselves. And God, None of that matters because your grace presumes our imperfection and that you love us anyways. And so I pray that there would just be peace and joy and a sense of love today, Lord.